come. We want to maybe have uh, some more of our conspiracy. We have some of the sick over there. Maybe a little bit more of conspiracy today. You see my little frog is still there. I don't know where he gets all the water from. But I think the water is down there. And he pumps it up. It's a dirty little trick. <laughs> okay, we came to the question five, as you remember. And we have, this is our second uh, review of what we have done. So you have another week. And we came to question five. So that what happened to the word spirit? We looked in our everyday language. We had the president's uh, nation talk there. And there you could feel the spirit. You know, if, uh, there's something like that. Particularly when he made this beautiful rhetoric thing about the gun laws and about uh, the people who have been shot and so on and so on. It was amazing that, uh, you know, in terms of language thing, but it showed some unity. Everybody got up and, and so on. That is what is still called uh, spirit. On the more, that's political level, on the more philosophical level, spirit is the same thing like love. And love and spirit have in common that it means identity, it means unity, it means differentiated unity. It means a unity which conquers uh, opposites, which conquers contradictions. So the speech was about the almost more perfect union. The union, in order to establish itself, has to conquer antagonisms all the time between the parties, uh, between the generations, between the genders, and so on. So we have these masses of contradictions and discrepancies and spirit is that what keeps all that together uh, which conquers so those antagonisms and that can happen on the level of the subject then we call it subjective spirit it can happen on the level of society then we call it objective spirit and it can happen on the level of uh, art religion philosophy and then we call it uh, the absolute spirit that is the old thing in the Frankfurt School they still used those three forms of spirit and they wanted to rescue the spirit against fascism. They saw fascism as a force type of a unity and as killing of the spirit, the killing of the German spirit and they wanted to rescue some of that spirit against fascism in, uh, including the language in which the spirit of a nation expresses itself. Now. A simpler way, maybe, uh, in terms of our pathology. So it is really what we are talking about is the pathology of spirit. Part of the spirit is reason. Then we can call it the pathology of reason. And uh, then we can also call it the pathology of will or of subjective freedom. That means that the individuals want to be free, uh, like little atoms uh, circling around about neglecting the whole, the, uh, the community, the collective. So we can maybe say that the illness of the spirit in modern time has something to do with the antagonism between the religious and the secular and between the individual and the collective. So in order to bring it down and to make it simple, uh, the, in the mi Middle Ages we had some kind of a differentiated unity between the secular world. There was a secular world, the towns, the market, and all this. But then there was a dominant religion, Roman Catholicism, and uh, there was somehow no split between them. There was a differentiation. And the same thing is true with the Topoyan island, Topoyan islanders or um, African tribes or whatever. The, there is a differentiation between secular things. So. The Topian Islanders, for instance, they go fishing in the Laguna. There they uh, do it with technology in a secular way. But when they go out to the ocean, they are not in total control. And then they call for the ballooners, for the spirits, to help them and so on. So that means there is a differentiation between the religious and the secular. But what has happened once only in world history as we know it, and that is that this differentiation in the West, in Europe turned into an antagonism and contradiction and we can name this namely Galileo Galilei, Galileo, um, where it happened between religion and science and that then was only
only the beginning. It goes on then with Darwin. Uh, it goes on with Marx, with Freud, uh, with the quantum physics, and so on. So um, it went deeper and deeper, and that had never happened before. So, and it is this inability to get those two things together which makes the spirit sick or which kills the spirit. Not to say, you know, that our psychology does, of course, not use the word spirit. Uh, Skinner does have a black box. That's all. The word spirit is just out of space. Even the word psyche is too much. Sometimes it's reduced to the brain, simply. So, psychology has no place for spirit or for the psyche or even personality. The whole positivistic development uh, goes on the question uh, if the ego can be rescued. They don't even have an ego left. There is an organism and there is the environment with the stimuli and their reaction to those stimuli and so on, but there is no real ego. So Mach, for instance, against whom Lenin argued, uh, said the ego cannot be rescued. That is part of the positivistic, naturalistic type of a, of a development. So, <coughs> so but important is, if it is true that spirit means that opposites, gender, man, women, and so on, um, that this antagonism is conquered, then the inability to overcome this antagonism between the religious and the secular constitutes one of the pathology of spirit or the pathology of reason. Now the Pope uh, tried all the time to uh, keep that faith and reason together. That is the ideal of Catholicism and Thomas Aquinas was the great teacher who made this synthesis. But what was called reason at that time, with Plato and Aristotle still in the background, and what is called reason today is a different thing. The reason which underlies the sciences is analytical understanding. On one side the sentences, and then uh, the senses, and then we call it empiricism. And our so sociology is empiricism. Uh, that comes from England, or it is rationalism, and that comes from France. And sometimes we have a combination of empiricism and rationalism. But when we mean rationalism, ratio, reason, we mean analytical understanding, the ability to differentiate between chemical elements, or in physics between different parts of, the, of, of any kind of a body, uh, in biology between the species and the genie and, and so on, this differentiation, this power of differentiation, constitutes analytical understanding. And this analytical understanding is carried by the third estate. That means by the bourgeoisie, by the burghers, by the people who were trained in, in instrumental rationality, uh, shopkeepers uh, in, in circulation and uh, carpenters and shoemakers and so on. So they developed this analytical understanding. They became tremendously uh, progressive that way, and the productive too, and in the 16th, 17th, 18th century they discovered that they are the producers and that the damned clergy, the first estate, and the second estate, the nobility, were unproductive. And by 1776, 1789, and so on, they were just tired of that. To produce at the time, all the time, they were the producers, and on top there were these guys who had these beautiful wings and uh, things around their necks and beautiful uniforms and horses and castles and so on and didn't do any work. That is the explosive power behind this whole thing. So we have not only you know, the level of epistemology, how we know and so on, but also on the level of sociology, namely in terms of stratification, we know the stratum where this analytical understanding, which takes things apart, which shows the antagonisms but doesn't get them together. There is another level in our subjectivity, and that is dialectical reason. Dialectical reason also identifies the antagonisms, but then tries to conquer them, to bring about a synthesis, to bring about a union, and so on. But that is on another, on a different level. In our universities, we train the senses, and we train even more so the analytical understanding to take things apart, but we do not train the dialectical reason. So that is something which we have 
introduced here, which I introduced in my classes and so on, that makes things a little bit more complicated. So we are comfortable with empiricism, we are comfortable with uh, analytical understanding, which is the type of rationality which underlies deism, for instance. In religion they come up with this abstract a supreme being, the capus mortuum, the head of the dead, and so on. Marx calls it that way too, and Hegel have called it. So that is our civil religion, which has no content. And sometimes when we use spirituality, we mentioned that already, in, in the religion department, I said, what the hell is the content of this spirituality? And, um, of course, for Meister Eckhart, the content of spirituality is giving. So, uh, when you are a giving person, you have spirituality. When you are a selfish creep there, uh, you know, greedy and so on, then you are not spiritual, you are unspiritual. That would be so, if we if I not only criticize and say, uh, you have this title, you know, spirituality and health and so on, uh, and you don't even say what the hell that is, the spirituality. One determination which we could introduce would that be that a spiritual person is a giving person who gives to the body and the soul continually. The unspiritual person is a narcissistic one, holding things to himself and so on. Also, Horkheimer would uh, see in Jesus a person who could not hold himself back, who had to give himself to everything mortal in nature and in history and so on. They, this then Jesus could be a wonderful example of spirituality. So one could fill that notion of spirituality. The question is, you know, if if, uh, if we get a consensus about that. So uh, nevertheless, the second thing is very similar. <laughs> that means since the beginning of the, the, the Renaissance and the Reformation, we have another antagonism between the individual and the collective. So that means we have in the medieval society integration. The individual is integrated into the family. The family in, uh, in the Near East and so on and also in Europe may even have been arranged. So that means the dominance of the universal over the particular of the clan or the tribe or the family determines who marries whom uh, in the, on the nobility level of course they are the marriage you know, for political reasons and so on so the family not love of the individual but the family determined who married whom and uh, people always thought when you have this movie uh, also on the popular level this movie The Fiddler on the Roof um, that is shown the transition from from arrangement to dating and uh, where the individual comes into the foreground. So we have a development in which the individual on the family level, on the social level, it means to get out of the guilds, slowly to become independent entrepreneur uh, who is not limited by the guilds anymore, who can make as much profit as he wants to. So the individual becomes, we could call that autonomous, um, is on, on his own law, his own profit drive, and so on, and not the law of the community or the law of the guild uh, or any policing force, and so on. Uh, so, and then we have it uh, also in the state, uh, where we have hubs. You know, the great uh, theoretician of the state, uh, the uh, where he thinks that um, people are all selfish. So the whole ideal that uh, homo socialis, man is a social being, and so on, of Aristotle and so on, was all cancelled by the bourgeoisie. Hobbes is a bourgeois uh, thinker, and uh, so everybody is selfish, and everybody is competing with everybody else, uh, and so in order not to kill each other, as we have this all this killing, including the president's wonderful speech there, with going up and about all these people who had been killed in recent uh, weeks and so on. So um, therefore they make a contract. So we have then the state comes down to a contractual relationship. So when you look at your roadmap there, you'll see there's the subject and then comes abstract right. Under this abstract right, you have property, contract, and crimes and punishment, uh, uh, crimes against contract, and so on. So the contractual level is the moral level on which the bourgeois moves. Personal morality is a little bit higher level that they have a hard time to get there already. But um, contract, the bourgeoisie makes 
so the marriage a contract. It was never a contract before. So that means uh, marriage means that you contract out your sexual part to your partner. Your partner has a right to use your sexual parts and you have this uh, mutual right, it's a mutual property. Suddenly there's a property relation. So you could say that the old Christian idea that marriage is a covenant is a little bit a, but that marriage is a contract and a property owners, that is a little bit too low. So, but that comes with the third estate, with the bourgeoisie. We see something here which we have to discuss deeper. You are trained in sociology, and uh, in our terms of language, you are trained in the traditional theory, the traditional theory. So, if you have Parsons, or you have Durkheim, or you have Max Weber, all that is the traditional theory. At the same time, we introduce ourselves into the critical theory, now, what in God's name is the difference between those two, right? That we have to make clear, and we will do that next. But um, before we do that, let me just uh, tell you about this uh, emancipation of the individual from the group, from the family, from the state. Uh, the individuals become isolated. They are all turned against each other. Everybody competes with everybody else. The cooperative ideas of the Middle Ages disappear, and so that they don't kill each other off, they make now a contract. So the state becomes a contract. These are the modern bourgeois contractual theories, which are still valid today. <coughs> so, uh, the, um, uh, in the religious realm, you have Luther, just to make give a clear example. You have then, of course, the great artists of the Renaissance like Leonardo da Vinci and so on, a great man, a great man theory comes up, these outstanding people who uh, don't have moral controls anymore, it's interesting, even the papacy where you have Alexander the Sixth, for instance, of the Borgia family, you have the, the uh, Lucrezia Borgia and Alexander Borgia, um, who try to, from below, to establish united Italy, and therefore the um, the brother marries his sister, Lucretia, to one prince after the other, then she poisons them all and marries the next one, and therefore they uh, try to unite uh, um, unite Italy, which only happened then in 1870, when uh, the, the Italy was united. So they were by uh, very 50, you know, what is it, 20, 30 years, uh, 30, 300, 400 years ahead of their time. But, um, but whatever you see, culture wars and so on, you must not think that this happened yesterday or whatever. America uh, falls into the new area, era, so it, it was never real medieval or whatever. So it was modern from the very beginning, it was bourgeois from the very beginning, except there were, of course, noblemen in Central America, South America, and Canada, but there was never a nobleman here in this country, except Lord Baltimore, and he stayed only for three years, and then he left again. So you have here the clearest form of a third estate uh, regime. And yesterday in the speech of the president, he wants to let everybody come into the third state, third estate. Let all these people, you know, give them a chance, the opportunity. From kindergarten on, we must not let the shine behind. And the, the idea is that the fourth estate, the 200 million workers, as many as can, should through education enter the third estate. So it's not the solution that you overcome the antagonism between the fourth and the third, or making a revolution or whatever, but invite whoever is able, it's not lazy, who is lazy is condemned to go into the slums, but whoever will be hard working, the president said, he deserves it to go into the middle class, <laughs> you have it. If you once know the key, you know what they really mean, otherwise, sociologically, it's very hard to get your what do they say, to get your head around <laughs> the notion of the middle class. So you have to listen to them for a long time in order to know what this hard-working middle class is. And those who are left out, which are about 200 million people on the bottom there, and um, they will stay there forever. They do the work. I wonder, you know, if they would all get into the third estate, who the hell would do the work? because the fourth estate does the work. The others are sitting in the bank and speculate with their money or whatever and call that work when they phone somebody. 
my friend there in Wall Street, uh, all what he does is he stands there and shouts, ah, 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 <laughs> and he gets some, some investment there, and, so, and then he takes the guys out there to restaurants, expensive restaurants, boat trips, and so on. And that is, you know, that is what he calls work. It's what the guys who really work and build a car or a house, my neighbor, or so, that's really work. The others is a little bit analogical analogy of work, including myself, by the way. Uh, in, a, in a specific sense, professors do not work, ministers do not work. That's talking. It's talking and remembrance, but it is not work and tool. Uh, then when we say, you know, that priest works hard, or that is a social worker, uh, it is a little bit something different than what real work means, and uh, this this type of building things which produces wealth, of course. The social worker does not exactly make the nation richer or so, but makes the accumulation of wealth, according to Adam Smith, that is productive capital, or in terms of Henry Ford, or of Taylorism, Fordism, and so on, to turn the assembly line faster and faster and faster. <laughs> the day they have that too in white collar workers. So my sons are working in some positions in corporations, but one is an overseer of this uh, travel, big, huge travel company which advertises all the time. What is it called? Expedia. Huh? Expedia. Expedia, yeah, Expedia. And uh, every few months, you know, they turn the number of telephone people whom he has to supervise. I mean, globally, it goes from 500 to 1,000 to 2,000, to 5,000, and so they let him run and run and run, and uh, the other one is in another uh, corporation, has a high position, but still when he travels to China, it is all reglamented, you have to take one hour to eat, or half an hour, and uh, two hours to visit with this firm, and you have to go right direct to, to the airport, and so on. They very often only see the airport, they don't see Peking or whatever, and so on. So and that is all, that is Fordism, that's Taylorism. So that means to increase the productivity and subordinate uh, everybody under that. So, <laughs> nevertheless, the antagonism between the individual and the, uh, and the, uh, the uh, community. By the way, these antagonisms are necessary. You see, you cannot say, well, there is this and somebody else or whatever. But um, in reality, and also in our mind, these are necessary relationships. You cannot have individuals without a community. That's a necessity. You cannot have a community without individuals. You cannot have the sacred without the profane. You cannot have this profane without the sacred. You are not at liberty to leave one side out and say, for instance, as the Horkheimer in his younger years would say, uh, you could not say, you know, the individual alone is real the state and the family and so on, these are, are just ideas, it's just the people said that it's not real or whatever. They will tell you, you know, in the next corner when you are meeting a, a cop there who, uh, you know, writes you a ticket for not obeying the red light and so on, then you know that there is something else than the individual, you know. So, <laughs> so this, it's important that real thinking has to deal with necessity, right, not with arbitrariness. If the mind can just rubble around all over the place, that's not yet thinking. Thinking means to find necessities, lawfulness in procedures, and you cannot get out of this individual and collective, whatever you do. We have a psychology, which is concerned with the individual. We have a sociology, which is concerned with the, uh, the society. So we separate it. But this is only on the other level. In reality, there does not exist any individual which is not part of society, and there exists no society which does not have in place uh, 10, 100, whatever, million people, and so on. So this is a necessary relationship. And so, therefore, if uh, something goes wrong, that means when abstractions enter, this is an important word now, because the illness which we find among us has something to do with abstractions. That means we abstract, for instance, one side from the other. We say the individual is really real, but uh, the state and society and history and so on, that's just made up or it's just in our mind or it's uh, illusionary or whatever, that would be an abstraction. Or if you become a, that would be an individualist. If you become a collectivist, that is equally abstract. 
and therefore abstractions are always untrue and abstractions are always unhealthy now you, if you see porno or you, you know, go to Boston you know what, let's see the porno thing it's an enormous abstraction if you think of the human organism there's the form and there is the, the assimilation and digestion and so on and then there's sexuality and these are complicated things there they it's a combination of all kinds of procedures and processes and so on. Now, there are people, you know, chemists who say, love is just chemistry. But then, you know, this is an abstraction and you can see how chemistry can go wrong and so on. So, nevertheless, the, uh, or, or it's just a matter of the brain, or they concentrate on brain. Of course, we cannot do anything without the brain, but you cannot reduce spirit or psyche or whatever to the brain. I mean, Freud was first a brain physiologist. That's how he became famous. But that was not enough in order to get to pathologies. That's why he uh, developed psychoanalysis and did not stay with the brain. At the time of Hegel, there was the same fanaticism which we had now with the brain. And so, on. so whenever they make some steps forward and discover another side of the brain, then everybody concentrates on that because then they have a thing see the brain is a thing and then you can see or in and you have something to hold on to or whatever spirit that is so vague and it is not so really empirical and so on it is not immediate it is mediated and whatever is mediated is harder to grasp and therefore they would like to reduce the psyche and the spirit and the personality and so on to the brain then they add, like Tom Lawson said, the mind brain. I said, Tom, what is the mind brain? Make up your mind now. If it is just the brain, then you don't have any mind, and you cannot make it up. So, or you have the mind, or whatever. What is this stupid mind brain? That means you don't want to show your reductionism, therefore you add this empty thing, mind, on top of it. Leave it out, and you have the same same thing. You don't need it, really. Leave it out. <coughs> okay, so the uh, uh, what happened in terms of this pathology, in terms of individual and collective, <laughs> the Luther had already this tremendous struggle in the monastery. He was Augustinian Aramite, and he had um, gotten into that because he experienced a lightning strike in a forest in Thuringia, uh, and he, while he was frightened, he took an oath to Saint Anna, I think was the saint, and he took this oath that he would enter the priesthood. His father was against it, he was because he was a lawyer. And Luther came from the third estate, from the bourgeoisie, the burghers at that time. The whole reformation is a bourgeois movement. The farmers were under Thomas Münzer, and no bourgeois jo joined Thomas Münzer. Thomas Münzer was not the beginning of the bourgeois revolution. It was the beginning of the socialistic revolution. Even Engels had problems with, uh, with seeing that very, so who all the uh, thing about the farmer was. Uh, so Luther, uh, he entered the, the uh, uh, monastery. He was a very serious monk. He had all the abilities of a saint, and I think for me he is a saint. As a matter of fact, my professor was the first Catholic theologian who tried to write an honest, honest uh, uh, story about uh, a book about uh, two volumes, really, about Luther. Up to him, uh, the uh, fairy tale, which a priest in Frankfurt set into motion, where they said, "Well, Luther made the Reformation because he wanted to marry the nun," and so. So that means for 400 years. Catholic believed that fairy tale that Luther made the Reformation because he wanted to get mad. In reality, Luther did not even like Catherine. Catherine was four, f one of four nuns who took refuge in Wittenberg because they were post prosecuted in their uh, in their monasteries, and so and uh, it took a long time until finally, uh, you know, he decided he wanted to marry her. So it was. The other way around, um, it was not because of the marriage that he made the Reformation, but because he made the uh, Reformation 
and against the good works and so on that he gave up celibacy and so if if there is marriage with the five children and so on had any uh, uh, symbolic value then it was the reinforcement of uh, what he had done in 1517 in terms of the reformation but in the monastery he had great problems with sin and um, the I think we said it already that the content of art and the content of religion and the content of philosophy is the same only the form is different all three are under a form law a different form law so elements which you have in religion uh, like guilt uh, sin forgiveness punishment for sin and so on you find that in tragedies in dramas in poetry and so on in art and you find it in religion and you find it also in philosophy if it is really good uh, high philosophy and so on so um, but philosophy deals with those things on the level of thought religion on the level of images and stories and uh, uh, the in, in uh, art in terms of the senses architecture uh, painting music the ear and, and so on so um but they are hanging together and for us that's a little bit difficult to see because modernity means evolution and evolution means differentiation so we have differentiated off religion from art, philosophy from religion, and so on. So um, the Plato already separates from mythology and Homer's epos. So first we have the primitive myth. The myth is changed into poetry. That's what Homer does, into art. And then in and religion, and then philosophy separates itself from it. Science separated itself from philosophy only after Hegel. 1831 and after the 19th century and so on. So therefore in the campus people all hate philosophy, they hate theology because they are positivistic scientific people and therefore philosophy they separated themselves, they differentiated out as philosophy differentiated out from mythology, theology and so on before. <laughs> that was just on the side. So what were the struggles of Luther? <laughs> Luther wanted to feel as this individual that he was really forgiven so he felt that he was tremendously sinful and holy people the holier they are the more sinful they feel the less he feels the unholier they are my children never feel sinful whatsoever <laughs> they have no sins they don't have to go to confession or whatever so a saintly person is very intense on feeling this guilt, and Luther had that. And so he went to his father Staupitz. Staupitz was the head of the Augustinian Aramites in, in Wittenberg, and so he was his father confessor. And he went there on Saturday and confessed his sins, whatever a monk can do, you know, not coming punctually to Mass or <coughs> oversleeping or whatever. And uh, then uh, on Wednesday, he came back again to Staubitz and said he wanted to go to confession again. This is usually called a scrupulous conscience. And so Staubitz, like every good father confessor, said, don't come anymore, Martin. Don't come, please. You don't, it's all okay. The, uh, the treasure of grace of the Church, you participate in this treasure which has been uh, earned by Christ by his sacrifice and so on so therefore you can be sure that you are a member of the community of the church the Corpus Christi Mysticum of the Holy Spirit therefore your sins are forgiven but here is the split now this individual Luther was not enough grounded any longer in this community in order to feel certain so it's the issue, the struggle of certainty which drives moderns nuts. Also in the sciences, little Skinner bucks, you know, or the Pablo dogs. That's ins insane. To kill again and again and again little animals in order to see how they behave between electrode and a little piece of food or whatever. And they repeat that and they repeat that. This is a madhouse. So, nevertheless, Luther... <coughs> 
did not, that means he didn't feel it, he didn't experience it. So that's important for the, that's in individualism, religious individualism. Instead of a religious corporatism, like the community of saints, church and so on, he wants to be alone there and wants to be liberated in his conscience and so on. Staubitz was desperate and finally sent Luther to Rome. He thought when he takes a trip down there, happy year, whatever, he will be healed and he forget about all his sinfulness and so on. <coughs> so Luther went to Rome and uh, it was a miserable Rome. It was only maybe 20 years after Alexander the Sixth and the Lucrezia and the Borgia family. So hawing and killing and whatever was going on. The Borgia uh, daughter, as we mentioned, the Lucrezia, she poisoned one husband after the other in order to unite Italy and so on. So, but he didn't see anything. Luther didn't see anything of the whole perversion of Rome and of the Curia and of the Cardinals and all that. Uh, he took even those uh, mortification steps with his knees, knees crawling up the staircases and whatever asceticism, and, uh, what was called good works. Now. So, uh, um, so this this finally led to he fell once in in the choir uh, while they were all praying. He fell on his face there on the altar and said, "It's not me. It's not me. That means I'm not Satan." He had the feeling that Satan was after him all the time. Even when he was Eisenach, in Eisenach, after he had appeared in, in Worms, he uh, threw an ink pot against the uh, wall there because he thought Satan was sitting there while he was uh, uh, translating the Bible and so on. So, so the unbelievable tortures of the soul. And even today, when you compare a Protestant minister and a Catholic priest in Germany, usually, I mean, not always, but the Catholic priest is usually a very childlike person. He has a childlike face and uh, behaves like a child, too. The Protestant minister, you see it in his, that he's continually struggle, struggling because he cannot simply say the Pope said or the Church said or whatever. He has to fight it all through personally. Every culture war issue, he cannot refer to a decision by the Church as a whole but he has to stand up with it with his own conscience. So there Luther stood in warmth with the empire, the emperor Charles the uh, 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 what was it, Charles the Charles, 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 what was it, the sixth, right? Six, six, Charles the yeah. uh, It was Henry the Eighth and Charles the Sixth and Charles. And, and so, um, and he said that he was supposed to be rescinding the writings which he had done and he had a night to think about it, and he came back on the other day and said, um, it is not good to contradict one's own conscience or scripture. Therefore, I cannot rescind. And that could be the death penalty. So the prince of Thuringia took him out and put him into that castle. He took his uniform off there, the monk, and uh, yeah. appeared as a civilian. Here ich dann, ich kann nicht anders. Yeah, yeah, right. But that may be a little bit legendary. So here I stand, and I cannot do otherwise, because it is uh, to act against conscience and scripture and so on. And Charles so on. V. Charles V. No. no, I should know all the dissertation about. It. So <laughs> okay, so um, okay, so this we, we see there is something you know the the uh, this type of a scrupulous conscience is already in something pathological, it's not entirely healthy, but <coughs> where it comes from is that the individual is not any longer, I mean, individual is always different from the community, but um, the, the integration, as we call this sociologically, uh, the, this integration was there, and as this integration leads to disintegration, the individual is left alone, abandoned, and has to make all the decisions for himself or for herself. And that leads then, about 1800, <laughs> to a movement back to the church. So there are the whole, all romantics, uh, great thinkers, Novartis and others, uh, return to the mother church in Rome. <laughs> By the way, uh, this continues in England, and in three rivers there are these monks the uh, child uh, Henry the Eighth closed all the monasteries, 
but then by 1800 or so, and a little bit later, the movement set in, and they thought they had done away with too much of Catholicism. And in Oxford and Canterbury, they, uh, in Oxford particularly, they um, studied monasticism again, and then they were trained, these monks who came here, they bought that land there. In the meantime, they have built, you know, all kinds of uh, little houses for guests, and I take my students there all the time. And uh, so uh, that uh, that is a return, you know. So by 1800, or let's say this number there, um, people were so lonely inside of themselves and so conflicted in themselves that they tried to find a community again uh, to carry the burden of guilt or deviations and loneliness and aban abandonment and so on. And, and a century later, by 1900 or so, it's not a return to the church anymore, but it's a church uh, a return to mass movements, socialistic movements, uh, uh, fascist movements, and so because then you are in this mass and you march and you light and for the Führer and the Duce and so on and so on, and you forget your individuality, you get rid of it and you feel better. It's an unbelievable release when you can shout with millions of other people, heil, 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 and so on. Uh, so uh, that is, these are then secular movements, but which have the same function. And so when you see uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, in a, existentialism is an extreme form of individualism, but then Chaudhry changes, uh, joins the Mao movement, you know, the, the Chinese communists, and so on, in order to find a church, to find a community in which he can surrender himself, and so on. Others of the existentialists who did still return to the Catholic Church too, uh, because of the same thing, because of the untruth of, a, of an isolated type of an individual. We're often going into the opposite abstraction, namely a collectivism in which the individual loses his dignity and, and so on and so on. So, and we can say you know, that the Soviets and we, we suffered from uh, opposite uh, pathology. Um, they had solidarity, but there was not enough individuality, autonomy, and so on. And I found the same thing I experienced in East Germany, in the German Democratic Republic, and also in the Kibbutzim in, in Israel. <laughs> Particularly when you have reached a certain stage of individuation or age or whatever, it's almost impossible to become part of that again, because you have become so used to your isolation and autonomy and whatever, that you cannot live there. I could not live in a kibbutz. I lived there a few weeks, but uh, that was the end. And they told me that it's not possible. And when you go to the monks, they would not take anybody beyond 20 or 30 or whatever, um, because then you're so set in your ways and your individualism that you don't fit there anymore. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, abstractions. These abstractions are connected with um, with the illnesses. Abstractions are untruth, and we live more than we know. Uh, abstractions move between us and our own individuality and what is out there, the state or the family or whatever. I mentioned that example of sexuality, where what, what they do on porno, or, or the, the, you see the organism, you see they don't eat, usually sometimes they even drink wine a little bit, and then um, the sexual act, but there is no fertilization, there is no child, there is no love, there is no tenderness, nothing. It's a complete abstraction from all what belongs to that complex of sexuality. And it looks sensuous, but it is really abstract. The same way the whole prostitution, either it is, you know, um, the prostitution in the technical sense, or today so many people um, are not married or meet or whatever before or afterwards or besides marriage, then uh, um, there we have the same thing. Uh, one abstracts from everything what the other is, expect, uh, except the eroticism or sexuality and or the money or whatever. So she wants to have money, he wants to have sex. As soon as they talk with each other, things may become more concrete. Concrete means concrete to grow together. Abstractions grow together, and then things become more concrete. So when she says, I have to do that in order to feed my mother, or send my sister to college, or whatever, they may they talk that way. The more she 
she becomes concrete for him or the more he says my wife doesn't function and whatever that's why I have to come here and so then the more he becomes concrete for her but first of all it is an abstract object object relationship which only slowly concretizes into a subject subject relationship when you have work it is always the subject object is in the tree and the axe with which you cut the tree down that's the subject object relationship the sexual things are also object object related you are subject object related until it becomes more concrete and people become subjects for each other so but the before that happens these abstractions are symptoms of pathology and uh, sometimes people get very stubborn about these abstractions and individually and collectively and the more stubborn they become the more, more healthy the situation is the pathology is okay so what we said to sum it up um, what we call the pathology of the spirit of reason of will or whatever has something to do with specifically modern developments namely the uh, religious movement from uh, original union of religion and secularity through the modern disunion to a future reunion. The pathology is rooted in the disunion. Disunion is the cause of the pathology. As far as individual collective is concerned, uh, original unity of the two, disunion in modernity, and the attempt to lead to a reunion. All the socialistic fascist uh, movement have something to do with this reunion at the end, Marx too. So, um, but before we reach that reunion, the disunion is the continual source which feeds on this, on this pathology, uh, feeds on, uh, um, uh, this disunion is the continual source on which pathologies feed and become, uh, they are, uh, you know, more intense or less intense. And we have these two types, you know, the Don Juan, um, where we, uh, instead of saying pathology of spirit pathology of reason we called it pathology of uh, of freedom that means freedom as absence of alienation as going out of oneself and to returning that would be healthy unhealthy is if one cannot go out to the other or if one is out with the other cannot return to himself that is unhealthy that is pathological Narcissus is pathological. Uh, masses of Americans are narcissistic. Hobbes' idea of the state of Leviathan uh, presupposes these narcissistic types who all fight against each other all the time. That is pathology. And to overcome this, and also in a religious form, because Hobbes uh, is also the father of the concentration camps there, um, he has religious wars behind him and he has to make a contract in order to keep the civil war out of the state. He had to create a secular state, uh, following up Machiavelli, by the way. In Machiavelli, you have it the first time, where this narcissistic, isolated individual there uh, runs around and has lost all contacts with the, uh, with the community, and uh, is therefore sick. So, um, so Don Juan, who cannot, never finds a woman in whom he could come home to himself. Not because there were not women like that, but because of his own disposition that he could not see that there was maybe a woman who really loved him and would allow him to go out of himself and to return to himself. And therefore Mozart puts him into hell. Then he goes into the abyss there and burns up. So because he lived always in a pathology means a hellish type of an existence. Narcissus is a hellish existence, and Don Juan is a hellish existence too. Both are abstractions, right? That means art produces them or whatever. In reality, they cannot exist. A pure narcissistic guy could not possibly exist. A pure Don Juan could not exist, really. So, uh, see, the Max Weber would call that ideal types, where you uh, crystallize out, you know, certain types, and you do. Uh, purify them completely from the opposite and uh, these guys could not possibly exist in reality okay now we started already this thing and for everything
whatever it comes in here, it does not really matter. Um, and two things, a timeline I want to introduce somewhere here. And um, But this traditional is very important for us as sociologists, what the difference is. So let's take a famous and very powerful traditional theory, and that would be, of course, Parsons and Merton and so on, which goes back to Max Weber and also to Emil Durkheim and so on the whole functional, structural functional type of a theory. So that's traditional. So what is it? It means that you have a network of concepts, like you have it on on my uh, road map there, right? There, there you have, some, on the road map you have these categories there. Um, I find my, here is my road map. So here you have all these categories there nature, you have the mechanical and so on, and private wide, and this is so you have a whole network of uh, concepts. I like that you want to see them? No. No, okay. And then on one side you have that in your mind, and then you have things out there, and you order them in such a way that they fit into this type of a schema. Kant calls that a schema or schemata. Um, and that is the traditional science. That's how it operates. And if you subordinate all that material under these categories, then you are supposed to be able to predict what is happening with the family and future and so on and so on. That is the ideal of a traditional uh, theory. Now, what is the critical theory? Uh, the most advanced theory today would have to fulfill certain requirements. It has to give you, first of all, the structure of the object. The object of sociology is society. So you have to make yourself familiar of this object. Then you have to reflect on yourself, the one who looks at this object, and you have to think of your own structure. That is dealt with by the sociology of sociology. Right? So if you come from the fourth estate, from the working class, you will look at things differently than when you come from the third estate and your parents were professors or medical doctors or whatever. Um, so then the, that is your own structure of your own intelligence and your own memory and your own will and so on, your own interests that you have to be aware of. You see, there's already different because positivism of the traditional way is to separate yourself from and just look at the facts, think of the data and the facts, and then uh, put the, uh, the, the statistics on it and mathematize the whole thing and so on. And uh, like they do in physics, an imitation of physics, where you see that the degrees of warmth or coldness goes up and down, and then water changes its quality. It changes in steam or changes into ice. Um, so that means at a certain point the quality the quantity moves over into quality. So the um, uh, so that the traditional thing means to have that network of things. And now we go over to the critical one. The critical means that you not only see now this uh, this object or this system which you have developed or the object, the society which you want to study, but that you also have to be aware of your own structure. And number three, you have to be aware of the evolutionary process in which the structure of the object and the structure of the subject are continually changing. Now, in the critical theory, that evolutionary process is identified as working process as a synthesizing working process. That means society um, is in continual motion because it has to perfect its means by which it conquers nature. It is involved in a metabolism by which it plants potatoes and brings them back and feeds potatoes, builds houses, but uses clothing and so on. So the individual and the society are involved in a process, in a production process, in which both sides, both structures, are continually changing. So as they transform nature, 
uh, what you see around here, the houses, the streets, this is all culture landscape, right? As I lived here, the nature retreated more and more, and nature was more and more transformed into a culture landscape. That means a landscape produced by human work. The neighbor just built something, added something to his house. Then they built something in the Horton place down there, see, and this is all work. They hammer around with tools and so on, and transform the landscape. And as they transform the landscape, they transform themselves, the collective as well as the individual. Now, science, sociology, is part of this production process. That is what is missing in traditional theory. Traditional theory is not aware of this production process. That means for traditional theory, the human species has not yet become the subject of its own activities. But they were objectivistic, like a fate which happens to people. So Hitler told to his secretary in the end, fate wanted it that way. That is a blind spot because he himself had to do something with that, that things were that way. But not he alone, of course, also Churchill, and also Roosevelt, and the liberal countries, and the socialistic country, and the fascist countries, and so on. But they were all of human making. They were all human products, and so on. So that means traditional theory is blind for the conditions under which society reproduces itself, and it, sociology, is just the way how man reflects on this self-production. But it doesn't see it that way. It sees sociology as part of a superstructure, as something set apart. And you are supposed to be a theoretician and not to do practice. So the politician is not a political scientist. The political scientist is not a politician. The sociologist is not necessarily a social worker. The social worker is not necessarily a sociology. So you have a split between theory and praxis on the traditional side. You have the dialectics of theory and praxis on the other side. But the main thing is the blindness of the traditional theory to what extent it, it itself is a factor in the reproduction of society. So, therefore, and you can test this by talking with people, you know, in the sociology department. The um, sociology which we have in our sociology department is the consequence of Kant, August Kant, and then Spencer. I told you once that I was visiting the grave of Marx and I looked at his monument and I was standing on the other side of the pathway and an American visitor came by and he said, do you know where you're standing? No, I looked out, it was my blind spot. I stood at Student Spencer's grave, Student Spencer's gravestone there. So Spencer is one of those uh, positivistic people. So Kant developed the word sociology and he developed the word positivism, positivistic sociology. But what does that have to do with the reproduction process? They are people who come up after the French Revolution. That means after the Third Estate won over the clergy and the nobility and guillotined them and hanged them in England or decapitated them. And so. so now the bourgeoisie uh, was not interested anymore in changing things. They did not want to do nice things for the fourth estate or whatever. They began now to kill down the fourth estate and so on. And they wanted to develop now a type of science which would affirm their status quo, their new status quo. And that is what our sociology does. Our sociology is a product of the third estate. It is the self-justification of the third estate. So when a little guy comes from the third estate and goes into sociology, they put into his brain, let's say, mind brain, a bourgeois mindset. So if he should ever have had a proletarian one, which he of course did not have, because we don't have proletarians. A proletarian is a worker who is aware of his being a worker. But if you are not aware of it, if you think you are 
are middle class or you have a false consciousness, you are not a real proletarian in the technical sense. So, um, therefore, if he would know who he is as a worker, then he would know that this is a bourgeois sociology department and that this bourgeois sociology department plays an important role in the reproduction of a society under domination of the um, of sociology, uh, domination of the third estate. And so when they make a decision if sociology should be taught in high schools, or if anthropology should be taught in high schools or whatever, or mathematics or whatever, they will always act according to the interest of the bourgeoisie. Is it in the interest of the bourgeoisie that sociology will be taught in high schools? If they think that sociology is nice and conservative, they will let it be taught. If they think that there are some critical elements involved in sociology, they will not let it be taught. So that is how things are. But do we know this? No. The sociology department is blind for this. And so the, but not only the sociology department, the species as such is blind about this. In a very detail, for instance, that when Obama, for instance, said, you know, we all need others to, um, uh, to, you know, to achieve something, and then there was a lot of protest from the white. No, entrepreneur, you know, Ford, he did it all by himself. And Ford himself thought he did it all by himself. So when the labor unions came in and the government forced the labor unions on him, they, he thought there was an unbelievable injustice. That was me. I did this. I did. I, I, I. All the time he had workers who did it, you know, not he himself. He had some ideas and so on, but, you know, if the others would not have helped him to do that, he wouldn't have gotten anywhere and so on. So this is part of this blindness, that we are not aware that, for instance, this economy or this business cycle or this crisis and so on is our own product. It is part of the way how we reproduce ourselves, not sexually. We do also reproduce ourselves sexually, one generation after the other and so on. But we also reproduce ourselves economically. And that means we are not aware that we are a subject of what happens objectively. So, go back again to theory formation. Theory formation means to see the structure of the object, to see the structure of the subject. The structure of the object and the subject are both part of this reproduction process which we, um, uh, which we are engaged in, and we don't know that we are engaged in it. The worker may be fired, he may say, I got a degree from Western and now they fire me. I don't deserve this and so on, you know. But it is his own thing which he cooperated in this objective structure of a commodity exchange society which fires him. <coughs> so it is not something ghostly or providential or whatever. It is something which the species collectively has produced. And therefore, we have to look, if we are the critical theory, we see the structure of the object and the structure of the subject as Heraclitus did. Everything flows. Everything is in motion. But what is more important, we are the very basis of this motion. So if we become alienated from the political order, or alienated from the economy, or alienated from the marriage system, then uh, we have to reappropriate this again, because that objective stuff which got away from us, this political organization and so on and so on, it's our doing, but as we produced it, it alienated itself from ourselves, and therefore we have to conquer it. But to be blind means it is as it is. The flower is the flower, the rose is the rose, and so on. The identity of philosophy, as, as people say in, in a ridiculing way, identity philosophy, um, you don't see that this is of our making, and therefore we could also unmake it, we could also remake it. So, <laughs> for the critical theory, the critical theory works in the direction that the human species becomes aware of itself as the subject of its own
own objective and subjective conditions. That must not necessarily lead to atheism, by the way. Also, that the protection, the uh, protection theory of Feuerbach, which belongs there, <coughs> does not mean that there is no absolute. So the question, I try to, to do that in my book, which I'm writing now, um, where in the um, uh, history of um, the definitions of the, ab uh, of the object of religion, in that sense, uh, the god or the gods, so from from magic and fetishism to polytheism to uh, the monotheism to deism and so on, where does Marx belong? And uh, I was very careful and did it only in a negative way. He did not regress to magic or fetishism became a witch or whatever. He did not regress to Greek or Roman polytheism nor to the present polytheism, because according to Max Weber, this is a polytheistic society. So um, he um, was a Jew, and he was a baptized Christian. He did not accept the Jewish or the Islamic idea of the absolute as Lord, to whom one had to submit, like a serf submits to the feudal lord, or the worker to the capitalist, or whatever. The, um, but he did also not proceed, except the young Marx, um, but not really to the idea that God, that the absolute is spirit, or that the absolute is love. So um, I, I left that open then. Um, in uh, The Frankfurt School people would say that they hope that the finite world of appearances, with all these unbelievable injustices which you see on television from hour to hour, um, that this will not be the last word. That means, in other words, that there is something infinite, that there is the Eternal One. And on the gravestone of Horkheimer, he has that, and you, Eternal One, alone I trust. <laughs> and Marx talks in his uh, high school uh, uh, stuff there, the Abitur, he talks about the, uh, the, the, uh, um, about the Eternal, but about what did he say that he got that from Master Eckhart, the... Um, um, what is it called? The, um, a spark, yeah. The spark of the soul, or the spark of the eternal, and that the greed and so on in civil society ruins that spark in us and so on. So that uh, and I, uh, showed the parallel of Marx's writing and then Eckhart's writing and so on, including the principle of equality, which Marx has including the principle of having uh, uh, to be overcome by, uh, by being, and also that spirituality means sharing, uh, or and that uh, the principle <coughs> to uh, receive uh, from the one who, uh, from his ability, and to, uh, to fulfill the needs of those who don't have anything, and so on. Uh, Eckhart and, and Marx have that all in common. So, and uh, the the bourgeoisie, the third estate, which then says Marx, you know, this is a religion's opiate and so on. That is a complete distortion of the whole thing. That means Marx was against evil religion, the evil religion which says, you know, greed is good, or or God may send me poverty, or what the rich I. I, I am the more I go to heaven and what is the sign that I go to heaven so this is all horrifying or a, a consolation religion Christ is my savior and then I kill a million people and think he saves me and so this is horrifying that means a consoling religion which uh, dulls the conscience so that one cannot feel anymore that flying in other titles and assassinating people they're standing at the restaurant or whatever the, the function that doesn't function anymore. This Christ is my savior has completely dulled the conscience of a whole nation so they don't even know anymore when they commit the most horrendous crimes. So that's evil religion. But nowhere does he fight against uh, good religion, which sharpens the conscience, nothing at all. So um, there, there you can see what, I mean, the acrobatics of the third estate. But the third estate is also not a 
of itself, really, and what it is doing at the third estate. They think Obama is doing this, or that is doing that, that they act collectively at the same time. That means the bourgeoisie is as unconscious of the role which it plays as it's the proletariat which they keep under their control or the fourth estate. And that means the whole human species is not aware of itself as producing itself in its objective and subjective forms. And its objective structures, like for instance family, society, state, history and so on, as well as in terms of the structure of its own consciousness or unconsciousness, what, it, what they are. So the difference between the traditional theory and the critical theory is this element of blindness, this element of unawareness of the production process in which the structure of the object and the structure of the subject are continually changed. And that's a massive type of a difference. You cannot bring Emil Durkheim together with Karl Marx. I try to make that clear to Katya all day long, and she does not get it, and so, because she got it in this department. And so. Marx is on the left. Emil Durkheim is on the right. Max Weber is on the right. There are people of the third estate. Let's see. We have to come to these contemporary issues there. There are three or four questions in there, but let's go to that Christopher Dorner there, Christopher Dorner, uh, this catastrophe which happened yesterday. As the president went to Washington, the whole thing started uh, right away. The next picture always on the side was this catastrophe of this Dorner. So he did his last attack yesterday. He shot two policemen. There was a sharpshooter. One killed one, and the other one had to have an operation and so on. But um, now, uh, you can see the, the television stations are, of course, owned by third estate people, all of them, collectively, the monopolies, and, uh, uh, and the news is influenced that way and so on. But how do they do this now when they report on this guy? He was black. And they hunted him through the bushes and the forest there, with the whole army of policemen and so on. The image should come up, by the way, that this happened in this country all the time. They hunted slaves, runaway slaves, through the forest until they lynched them and hanged them on a tree and so on. Of course, we have no slavery anymore. You know, that's long gone. This was the last 19th century and so on. But one cannot, if one dualistically splits the present from the past, as if those two things had nothing to do with it, then one is already in the traditional theory. So the critical theory means not dualism between the past and the present, but that it's a dialectical relationship and that they are necessarily connected, both of them. The, the, the conflict between him and the Los Angeles Police Department had something to do with this case a few years ago of this Rodney... Rodney King? Rodney King. Rodney King was a black man who was beaten up in Los Angeles and by a brutal white policeman and then um, several and then there was a riot in Los Angeles and the whole thing burned. With this Christopher Dorner something similar happened. He had a partner and the partner beat up a black man uh, a, a street person street person, black street person. And he went to the police department and denounced the partner that the partner had done this. The police department did not believe him. The police department said he made false statements about his partner. And therefore, he was fired. And then he went through all kinds of procedures. When these procedures were exhausted after fi five years, then he wrote this manifesto against the department. And then he went on that rampage. He concentrated on policemen. He had two prisoners, two servants in one of those cottages. He did not shoot them. He bound them up so that they couldn't be harmful to him. But he didn't kill him. But 
he killed another policeman and he had killed killed four policemen altogether or three policemen and, and the wife of one of them something like this uh, the wife and the policeman who was responsible that he uh, uh, was fired he didn't defend him adequately or whatever so but what I see now what, what we want to see here in terms of not traditional not critical what is traditional is how these anchor men talk about this. This is a traditional way. And uh, in this traditional way, you will see that there is a lot of forgetfulness behind that, which doesn't give the clear picture, which is involved in abstractions. It is not that what the anchor man says is untrue. He says true things. He brings up facts. He was a lieutenant in the Navy. He was a sharpshooter. He was honorably discharged by the Army and so on. So there is a whole long thing of facts which produces in us the impression that the man has been adequately covered. Justice has been done to him. They even brought some people up who were sympathetic to him on the news. In the class, in my class, which I have tomorrow morning, the, the religion and society, there were several of the students in sympathy with the policemen and were in opposition to the Los Angeles uh, Police Department. This police department is known among people of being violent and being corrupt. And so they thought that this fellow had some, uh, some kind of, a, of a point, he had a point somehow that there was something wrong in this with this police department and so on. But um, I don't think they wanted to justify him that way because even if there was something wrong that was not the adequate way how one cannot simply take the law into one's own hand and uh, uh, and then shoot people to pieces and, and, and so on and, and then shoot oneself. I don't even know if he shot himself or if they blew up that house, uh, there was a, there was a shot, a last shot, and sounded as if he had, as he was in the flames there, that he killed himself or whatever. <coughs> but what I want to say is now that the uh, whole way how the American society has reproduced itself and is producing itself, these objective structures, the objective structure of society and the structure of the subjects involved in all of this are not fixed as they are for the traditional theory but they are part of a process of reproduction and in this process if you go back to the beginning of the nation um, a whole race has been annihilated another race to which he belonged has been enslaved. And even after the Emancipation Proclamation, up to 1900, the enslavement practically continued until the black people were transformed from slaves into wage laborers on a very low level. Yesterday, the uh, president plans to bring the minimum wage up to $9. It is $8 where you don't even come above the poverty line even when you work hard, 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 all day long, you are not getting over the poverty line. So, and more of the black people who uh, got out of the enslavement um, are in, uh, in, in this group. There are 40 million people in the slums and, and a large percentage of them at all are, are black people. So, if we see the way how the society reproduces itself, then we understand better the structure, the police department, the administration of justice, the courts, the laws, etc., on one hand, and also the formation of the subjective consciousness of the perpetrator, as well as those who hunted him down, and all of us, because we all are part of this reproduction process, and we are nothing outside of it. So the um, critical theory uh, sees an analogy 
between the philosopher Kant, we mentioned very often that Kant is in the background, Hegel is in the background, Marx, Freud is in the background, right? They all have helped to bring about this critical theory of, of uh, religion. Kant shows how the individual, the transcendental subject, he calls that, not transcendence, God, beyond us, etc. But the transcendental subject means that the individual, by the a priori, a perception, that's why we don't have to go into the technical things, that man produces his world in a certain sense, that he imposes time and space on things, and the category of causation and so on. So that means we produce, according to Kant, we produce, not naive realism, the tree is a tree or whatever, but we produce the tree, and the mouse would see the tree, Tilly, and the cat, and the dog, and so on. We reproduce that, our psyche, our subjective, produces that. So, the same way how our subjectivity uh, produces our world, the same way also the human species as a whole, that's the analogy, reproduces itself continually in its outside world, this cultural landscape, as well as the inside world of our own consciousness and its formation. So, and the middle thing is Hegel's phenomenology of the spirit. Hegel's phenomenology of the spirit shows the um, evolution of the subjective and the objective spirit and the absolute spirit, stage by stage, through the different ages and so on, until he comes in the end to the absolute spirit. But it begins with sense perception, the seeing, touching, and so on, through analytical understanding, through reason, to absolute spirit. Marx interpreted this as a work process. That means what Hegel for Marx described, parallel to Kant, was how the human species reproduces itself, its institutions and states and societies, as well as its own consciousness through the centuries. That is the critical theory. Right? And therefore, this uh, production has happened, it continues to happen, and it will happen in the future. And the question is, in which direction will this reproduction go? Will we become more and more perfect the way we control nature? Do we destroy nature as we control it? As we become richer and so on, do we also become more emancipated? As we produce more wealth and distribute it better, will we also find more recognition as human beings in our dignity and so on? So whatever the critical theory discusses, it discusses in not in the static way, like the traditional theory in which we were all educated, but in a dynamic way. Uh, in the past, the present, and the future, when we come to a point where uh, the domination of one class becomes superfluous. There was obviously a stage in our development in which we needed slaveholders in which we needed few laws, in which we are need, needed Henry Ford and uh, Rockefeller and Carnegie and so on. But will we need them now? Will we need them forever? That is the question. This question cannot come up in the traditional theory. It is not supposed to come up in the traditional theory, because the traditional theory has to justify the masters as they are now, the stratification as it is now, and to present it as quasi-eternal to say, you know, as the slaveholders were overrun by the feudal lords, as the feudal lords were guillotined by the, uh, by the uh, third estate, so the third estate would be overrun by the fourth estate, would be treacherous and traitorous. You better don't write a thesis about this. You won't get a job. You won't get a money for your books. You have to pay them yourself. Okay, now that's heavy stuff now, right? It's not easy to grasp. And so you see why you are such elected people who have this ability and why so many people don't and maybe also instinctively don't want to because suddenly everything starts moving. And it is so much, so much nicer if one thinks everything stays as it is. Right? Maybe I can... Um, there is this little Indian book here and there you see the timeline, <laughs> because I discussed that a little bit abstractly now, but in this 
book there, and I just uh, can look through that, and it can be applied to many uh, questions there. So the first uh, thing there, the, um, uh, as far as the timeline, to a large uh, number of astronomers, the universe started to exist with the Big Bang, that was 14 billion years ago. I think that number still stands, by the way. When you write a book like this, you'll see that the texts are not remaining true. They don't become truer necessarily as time goes on. They become wrong, as a matter of fact, because they push these 14 billions out further and further, you know. So, 14 billion years ago, and now just think what the rabbi says, and he is only 6,000 years old, the rabbi. There you see the tremendous discrepancy between the Abrahamic religions uh, and, and what the modern science does, right? This is the antagonism we talked before, which is part of the pathology which uh, we are talking about. Including the early 600 million years of the so called Dark Age. That's not the Dark Age between 500 and 1000, so it was just yesterday, but that is in the cosmic Dark Age, during which a thick fog of hydrogen darkened almost completely the light of the young stars, and 9 billion years ago, before our planet came into existence, not to speak of life or man, or any civilizational development, that development which we talked about, the development of the human civilization as far as the species is concerned. And the critical theory is civilization uh, critique, which we don't do very much on the other side of the... Uh, some do, but uh, not very often. Civilization development, or any religion whatsoever evolved on it. Or then um, human beings have existed on our planet only since maybe one or two million. Some people go back to ten million years, but uh, I don't have, didn't find a broad consensus for that. So I was really careful and uh, uh, kept it with one or two billion. But one has to expect, you know, that it may go uh, further. By the way, the moon uh, before the moon came there was a horrible impact. That means another planet run into Venus and into us. And our moon is the result of that. It's good that we were not there, and I can only hope it will not happen too soon again. One or two, by the way, today or whatever, yesterday a little thing flew by very fast, and I don't know, maybe not very big, I think, but uh, there are things coming close sometimes. Maybe one or two million years ago, so let's say that is man's development. So that we are talking about in terms that that means that two million years ago the development of human beings was very blind. That means they were not aware that there were many others around or on other continents or that they were in a cooperative relationship of some kind. So it's a traditional theory, our critique of it is that it is not sufficient in overcome the blindness with, by which we are beaten. Only very recently, early human beings with upright walk, the Homo erectus, arose from the animal kingdom through mutation and selection. So we do take uh, Darwinism, but in a more refined form there, uh, seriously. So, but you know, many religious people, creationists don't, right? Um, the upright walk broadened the view of the Homo erectus over his environment, set free his hands for work and for fighting, particularly for war, and changed the female anatomy and thereby the intercourse and birth positions, and thus imitated the uh, what the, the missionary position there is the unnormal one. <laughs> it is now supposed to be the normal one, so the religious people sometimes put things upside down work and fighting and uh, change the female anatomy positions and thus initiate the specific the human evolutionary universals of work and tool which you have there on, on your old map there <laughs> sexuality struggle for recognition and community and so you have if you have this little book here you have also all the sources where I got that from up to 99.9% .9 of human history have been primordial prehistory without writing names of a nation, a religion, or a political or religious leader. Now Marx thinks that, and the critical theory thinks that this um, type of primordial prehistory is still going on. Marx hoped that this prehistory would end and that the real history would start. 
the prehistory capitalism belongs to that prehistory and all the barbarism, the killing and the world wars and all this. So the hope of the critical theorists is that the end of prehistory and the start of real history. Then since about 200,000 years, um, since the old Stone Age, the Homo sapiens has evolved on this earth. Homo sapiens, that's a very arrogant name there. It shows our blindness for ourselves. Still, modern man of today, 2013, calls himself proudly and maybe somewhat arrogantly with this name. The Homo sapiens differentiate himself from the animals through his ego consciousness. There you have the change of the subjective structure. Well, there's an objective subjective structure. So about uh, the uh, um, ego consciousness, uh, what is um, uh, maybe 10,000, 200,000 years ago, I think. And so that means a dog looks in the mirror and he doesn't see himself. We, since 200,000 years, we look into the mirror and we know ourselves. But before, one and a half million or whatever, two million years, we didn't. Neither. So um, then, from uh, ego consciousness, so ego consciousness, which is of course the basis of religion, morality, and all that. In the Stone Age, the Homo sapiens developed his specifically human potential of work and invented tools as well as weapons. Uh, that is not you know, yesterday. Our weapon industry here and gun control is not uh, really from yesterday, right? But not too old neither. He learned to control fire, he conquered the caves, which had been occupied by other predators. Early on, the Homo sapiens began to bury his dead, there we have beginning of religion, and to make sacrifices and to produce magically, religiously motivated cave paintings, reliefs, and even full plastic. So here we see the growth of art, religion, and later on also philosophy. Religion is still closest to people. Art has moved away from them. And philosophy has moved heaven knows where. And even science and so on has moved away from people and so on. So but religion, it is a religion where people touch not only the religious content, but the artistic content and the philosophical content. So the catechism uh, contains uh, philosophical concepts and so on, but not in the adequate form. So what the philosopher is, the philosopher is not against the content of religion. He is against the childlike form of religion or the childlike form of art. Okay, um, that is the Homo sapiens there, paint, cave paintings and so on. Uh, all these activities presupposed initial developments of the specifically human potentials of language and memory and of the struggle for recognition. So, what I want to impress you with is, when you look through the eyes of the critical theory, that all these things, uh, these changes of the objective structure and the subject subjective structure, happens in a synthesizing production work process. So, you see, the, the hands are free, we're standing up, we can look over the savannah grass, but that the hands become free and flexible and so on, is an important moment, but uh, the traditional theory sees it just abstractly. What we do in the critical theory is that we integrate these elements into a whole process, continuous process, in which one thing follows with necessity out of the other. Uh, and then we have here 10,000 years ago, since the great transformation of the young Stone Age, there existed besides the hunters and, and food gatherers, also more and more sedentary farmers and animal tamers and so on. You see, also as the reproduction process continues, old stuff remains. So we still have fishermen at the lake and we still have hunters with the guns uh, going through the uh, shooting little deer, including my grandchildren. So there are leftovers, residuals, which uh, sometimes modern people reject. Hitler, for instance, was furiously against hunting. He was a, 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 also lived on a diet. He was a, he didn't eat any any meat whatsoever. So he thought that was primitive, and he wanted all people to follow him. And this, so he he also wanted to the, all the leaders, the the governors were supposed to live in celibacy, but he knew that the pigs were too poor to in, in their inner structure that they couldn't do it. Probably, and so on. so 
Uh, so in this reproduction process, people leave stages behind, and but also residuals remain at the same time. The there is a tremendous methodological uh, difference between abstract negation, where you leave something, get rid of it completely, and concrete negation, in which you get rid of things, but you preserve them too, in a certain way. So, and uh, the critical theory is operating in terms of determinate negation or concrete negation, not abstract negation. Okay, then we have human beings erected in their firm living places, village cultures. So, from 10 years old, then we have village villages. This had why we don't have any villages here. That's very interesting, you know. We have towns, but we don't have any villages, and we have huge cities out of the towns and so on. Sometimes we build a town like uh, uh, the, the, the South Haven. No, not South Haven. Uh, what is this thing? There, this Indian name there? Uh, South of Holland? No. What is South Attack? Sag Attack, yeah. Sag Attack. There, uh, the uh, investors from from New York. They wanted to build a second Chicago there, and uh, they started out with paper mills and uh, no sewing sewing places in Sag Attack. And uh, the, we stole we stole their name. It was called Kalamazoo, and we stole the name. And Lansing, of course, you know, blessed the thieves. So we kept the name, and poor Sagatak had to find another name, namely Sagatak. But there was with an Asian name. What was the Asian name there? The, the town which they built there. Ganges? No, it's all on the sand now. Um, that is what the what Wall Street tried to build. Other Chicago, and it lasted about 70 years, and then the sawing mills had taken all the trees south and north, and had not replanted it. It was a very good symbol for capitalism in general. They didn't replant it, so suddenly they ran out of trees, because Chicago burned, and Holland burned, and they had to rebuild it, and all the wood was gone. So, they left it. Uh, they left it, and the sand got over it, so the churches, everything is... Uh, um, you can go to the Kalamazoo River out into the Lake Michigan and there you see it on the right side. Douglas? The hill. No, no, not Douglas. No, Douglas is another thing. No, it's a, it's an Asian name. Uh, huh. Singapore. Singapore. Oh, Singapore. It's Singapore. Please keep it. I'll forget it again. So it's <laughs> Singapore, yeah. I have to travel there. And, and there is one, there's one big villa standing there uh, besides those hills where all that is buried and this guy wanted to build a, a, a whole uh, area, new town with uh, wonderful rich houses and so on and he fought with the city the city got bankrupt over it and but he didn't come through he uh, still sits alone there in his villa and uh, nothing comes from it but uh, because they wanted to keep their dunes and all this so human beings erected in their firm Living places, village cultures, this had important social consequence. People were striving toward land ownership. Here you have private property, right? So when Jesus said that communism is the presupposition for the kingdom of God, this attack against poverty and other philosophical groups in Greece too. Not Epicure, by the way, who was the great materialistic father of Marx. Uh, Epicure was for private poverty still. But then all the monks you know, all the Christian monks, the Buddhist monks, etc., they're all communists. They reject private poverty as the source of all evil. So Marx is you know, a latecomer in all of this, and Master Eckhart the same way. And Master Eckhart also beggar order, the Dominicans for the beggar order, and, uh, and Franciscans beggar order, and um, then Francis, we talked about that, rebellion against the father, early capitalism, and so on. So the evilness which we have in the Bishop in Detroit said in that movie of Moore there, Capitalism, Love Story, and so on, Capitalism is absolutely evil. And two priests as well. That's unusual. The Catholics don't make usually those extreme statements or so. But the experience of Detroit in order to see the unbelievable rottenness of the system. But that is not what traditional theory says, right? So traditional theory is uh, affirmative taught what is the case. That is the definition of positivism. Positivism is the metaphysics of what is the case. Capitalism is not the case, therefore it's a good thing. So, so even Obama would say so. Private poverty, right? Then, um, the one or the few start to rule over the many. So we have now class antagonism, 
And where we stand, you could see the President's uh, uh, Union speech there, uh, where the uh, where he said, you know, we cannot sacrifice all to the few. We have to think of the many and so on. And therefore, the New Deal, he presented last night the, the new version of the New Deal, uh, including the uh, you know, uh, minimum wage and all this, and uh, infrastructure things, bridges have to be built and all this. And that's the New Deal. So that is also about liberalism, which is a socially motivated, modif modified liberalism. And on the other hand, you have these Greeks, Ron Paul, and so on, the uh, libertarians too, and, and but also your man there. Um, yeah, she's a man. Yeah, yeah she, <laughs> and Rand, and, and our guy, what is his name? The Friedman? No, the politician there. Whom you had. Ron Paul, or uh, Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan, Paul Ryan, yeah. That's the same. There you have it. That is, that is the older liberalism, socially unmodified, and so on. So, uh, then the class struggle begins to characterize human history so that the reproduction process is antagonistic between the classes then is part of the critical theory of, um, of society, right? So, and this antagonism is a motor which drives forward this reproduction process. So there's the antagonism with nature. Nature has to be conquered. Metabolism between nature and us as individuals and collective. But in this inside, there is another antagonism, that between the classes, and that it makes up the dynamics of this. It doesn't stand still for one moment. So when Hegel says you can see providence at work in the newspaper in the morning, you can turn that sting on there. If you're a real sociologist, good sociologist, you would see in every sentence which they say where they are. It's like the clock ticking from one moment of this reproduction process to the next. And so if you can decode it, right, what they say. Rudy, uh, yeah. it's about quarter after eight. Did you want to take a break and then... Yes, let's take a break. Let me just finish that up here, this okay. little thing there, so because I don't know if you have it over there, but I just want to go, uh, just finish that up for a moment there. Where, where was I here? Okay, so... Um, so land dip and private poverty, and then also the so-called just wars, right? I mean, ironically, just wars. Uh, most wars are wars of thievery, right? We went to Vietnam for rubber, we went to El Salvador for coffee, we went to Iraq for oil, and so on. So Hitler's war in, in Russia was thievery, he wanted to steal the whole land there. Uh, England stole all of India, we stole Central America, South America, the Philippines, and so all capitalistic countries need cheap labor and cheap resources and so on. So these are the just wars. They were not always there, right? So they have to, only after private poverty and so on was, was developed. And then we have here 10,000 years ago, it's the great transformation of the young stone if they existed. Okay, we have that, hunters and so on. The one of the few, we have then glass. The glass struggle begins to characterize the human reproduction process and uh, then the nature landscape turned into a cultural landscape. That's what I mentioned before, right? And uh, villages grew into cities and city-states. The oldest city besides Katal Huvuk in Asia Minor existed on primordial biblical ground, namely Jericho. I went to Jericho once, I think with my friend Ken. Jericho in the Jordan Valley, you know the, sto uh, the story of Jesus, a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and was beaten up and almost killed there. That is Jericho. In the rabbi's view, Jericho was at least a thousand years older when the Israelites prepared to attack the city that brought their route to the whole western plateau. Here you get in trouble with the Bible too, because the Bible says that uh, the people came and blew the horn and the walls of Jericho fell down. These walls were down already for a thousand years when they came so these are the problems of higher criticism, that is the application of critical thinking. It was the gateway to the promised land, the first utopia, um, milk and honey, the, the utopias come up with this reproduction process, and its capture was of the greatest importance to the Israelites. Gastang's excavation in 1931 on the site of ancient Jericho made an epoch in biblical studies. Among other results, Gastang fixed the date of the capture of Jericho as 1407, that's about the Moses time, uh, an exodus of the Pharaoh, and therefore that of the exodus at, uh, as 1447. Uh, according to the radiocarbon research, the wars of Jericho stemmed from the year 6800, so it was long gone when the Israelites came. Inside the city-states developed out of the family, the civil society, and that's our society, right? All our problems, all the killing.
all the murdering, that's all civil society. And civil society moves into Croatia, suddenly they shoot in the schools. And they move into Ukraine, suddenly they have the corruption all over the place, which they didn't have before. So that is what the most difficult thing is always to capture that in mind which is closest to oneself, to become aware of m structure of my or your consciousness now and the structure of the society in which we live here now <coughs> without illusions and so on. That is the hardest thing to do. It's much easier to talk about that stuff than to about us where we are now. <coughs> situate itself between family and state in the tragedy of Antigone. Antigone, only family and state opposed each other. There was no civil society yet. And so on. so uh, the city-state of Sodom, being like Jericho under the rule of a king and a priest, a civil society had developed already. So with civil society comes the homosexual stuff and all that, particularly when civil society declines. The reason why Rome and many religious people, you know, are not very impressed about these things and the innovation of, you know, of homosexuals uh, is uh, the Roman Catholic Church saw the decline of the Roman Empire and there everybody had its boy. And then also the decline of the Middle Ages, also everybody had its boy. Uh, many of the, of the artists were homosexuals. Also in the end of antiquity, Caesar was a homosexual. And so now with the collapse of our civilization, of course, the whole thing comes out of the closet. That's how they see it, by the way. It's not necessarily that I see it. I mean, I have a son who is homosexual. And it's a very, very difficult thing. I mean, we love him. Uh, difficult for him. I mean, no family, you know. He's a lawyer in New York. And, and it's, it's a very hard existence. If he had, didn't have us, you know, his sisters, he has a sister in New York who's also a lawyer and has a brother who is a CEO and so and so. Therefore he has family, but if he was with his homosexuality alone, it would be very sad as you get older, you know, and all this. So it's not an easy, easy matter. So and I I don't necessarily subscribe to this decadence theory which you know, which some people follow. I mean in Europe they're still throw every homosexual out of the out of the family. It's a very sad story. And they were put in the concentration camps, you know. Um there Hitler had one SA leader who was a homosexual and he sent him a revolver to shoot himself. Okay, so uh, that is enough there for um the uh, then uh, just the last word there. Uh, the Euphrates and Tigris culture uh are uh, the uh, uh, oldest one which we know, so that is about uh, four, four, so third century. And then we have the Nile civilization, we have the Hindu civilization, and the Yellow River civilization. These are the four great civilizations, and that is also the axis H, uh, which they use sometimes today. That means uh, all the breakthrough of high religions, high culture, and all the beginning of philosophy in Greece, and so on. Okay, so there is the Shang, Shang culture, Nile, Indus, and Shang culture. But these four cultures, um, and these now, that's important for us now. We see this all, not only know that it has happened or whatever, but we see it as stages in the self-reproduction of the species. Not only of the Athenians or the Egyptians or whatever, but these are all moments in this self-reproduction so is slavery, so is serfdom, so is capitalism. Capitalism will not last as little as it is uh, feudalism or whatever. And socialism will not last neither. And Karl Marx was asked, he did not think that uh, communism, in which we uh, last in a society, free society and so on, that this wouldn't last neither. That means it would be also a moment in this reproduction of the genus or the species. Genus and species are the same for us. You know, the, some people think that the different races are really subspecies of the, you know, and, uh, but the genus and the species with us is the same thing. And uh, and uh, uh, proof for that is that we can all reproduce, so that all the races can uh, reproduce uh, successfully, and not like the horse and the donkey, which can reproduce, but you know, only one generation. By the way, I want to make clear to the journalist there who called me up, I, I gave a report on the Pope there for the Kalamazuga said, and I said the Pope was God's donkey, and I must have pronounced it the wrong way. So <laughs> I had to spell donkey. As a matter of fact, I had to spell every word there. It has come out in the meantime. Did it come out? Somebody 
besides, uh, <laughs> it says something like, uh, Kalamazoo theologian says something like that. <laughs> I will not look at it. I will get his talk, so I will not, <laughs> I will not read it. But you can read it if you want to. Okay, so yes, let's have a break. And then um, we can, uh, you can ask what, whatever questions you have, or we can look a little bit further here. By the way, if you would need, you know, another bit of two, we can be very relaxed here, um, and can continue that the next time. Oh, you had to talk to Ursula. Huh? You yeah. talked to Ursula, didn't you? Which Ursula? Ursula Zrili. Uh, it comes with that. Oh, that her? Yeah. Do you know her? Yeah. I don't know. She is for economic news, I think, and and general news, I think, both. Yeah, she covered when we did Occupy Kalamazoo, too. Oh, really? She, uh, she was very nice. But I didn't get her name. Let's see if I can pull this Have up. some water, have some cookies. For the death study, I'd be able to borrow one of those books. You can, yeah. As a matter of fact, it's yours. That's a present for you. That's one? All it's right. your Christmas present. Now what is coming up? Easter. It's your Easter present. All right, Easter present. Yeah. All right. If you want to have it too, you can have it too. Um, I you um, can use it. I've got um, legitimation crisis. Okay. Um, Very good. Yeah. Very good. Sounds good. So. Yeah. Um, is it hard to eat? Take your time, right? Uh, take your time, and uh, we can have another week if you want to. It's uh, I'm just I'm curious trying to figure out how to kind of fit it all in. Yeah, to right. What we're discussing here with the pathology. Yeah. I mean, he does talk about the spheres, and it kind of talks maybe to, yeah. you know, maybe more the. I don't know, this the formation and maybe the it false consciousness yeah. aspect more. Right. Of, you know. But let's say with Habermas, you know, um, he has. A double type of human actions, one which is rooted in work and tool, mm -hmm. and that is called instrumental activity, and the other one is rooted in language and memory and in recognition, mm -hmm. and that is called communicative action and communicative rationality. And the pathology comes in in that way that in the Western civilization, instrumental rationality grew tremendously technical rationality and the communicative rationality is suffocated. Okay. So we are sitting, you know, in wonderful airplanes and at the same time our families disintegrate, neighborhood disintegrate, we're not talking with each other and so on. So the pathology of the West, besides individual and collective, besides religion and secular, is this double rationality of which in one thing we made immense uh, 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 progress, you know, like airplanes and tanks and cars and so on. And it's unbelievable. Nobody ever did this, you know, as long as the species exists, you know. But at the same time, our communicative rationality, you know, how we deal with the genders, how we deal with the uh, generations, you know, um, that has suffocated, that has become uh, barbarous, you know, in a certain way. They had today, they punished somebody who they stripped a little boy somewhere in one town and the mayor was on, he was horribly upset and then they beat him up and that happened in August and nobody went to 9-11 or what, nothing it just happened on YouTube yesterday this beating of this little naked guy, you know um, appeared on YouTube and suddenly the mayor and everybody was aware of it, you know they were just horribly shocked that's not us, that's not us, you know it's barbarous and so on. So, but these uh, regression, these are regressive tendencies. You know, so what happens when the species, you know, moves forward in its reproduction? But it may not get linear. It may regress sometimes. You know? Well, does that kind of speak to what you were just talking about, where there are still kind of vestiges of like the older society that's still yeah. But that could be a good thing, you know. I mean, when you grow up and you remember your childhood. Uh, a great man like Goethe or whatever remained children in a certain way, you know. I mean, not childish, 
but you preserve something from the former stages of your life, of adolescence, a certain happiness, you know, mm -hmm. childlike, like Jesus would say, you know, happy are the children, because theirs is the kingdom of God. And so, so that is called concrete uh, negation. You preserve what you negate, or some of that of what you negate you preserve. And there's the abstra abstract one when you say, you know, even when you say, I hate religion, it's not entirely abstract because you are still connected with it. But if you are totally indifferent and say, this is child stuff, you know, that's the early childhood and of humankind, and uh, you throw it all out without seeing that there may have been something good in it, you know, that would be abstract negation. The real process of reproduction, you know, is rather concerned with concrete concrete negation. People build, you know, on on what other work others have done. We we are not tearing down all the streets, uh, houses in that street, you know. We add something to it, we improve, uh, like this one, I added this to it, and so on. <laughs> that is a good example. You see, you have something old, old house, and then I superseded into a new one in which the old one is preserved. That's a good image for for the reproduction process. Oh, and the sciences too. Look, there's a bicycle. You know, what are we doing? We we add an engine to the bicycle, and we motorcycle, right? And uh, so we we uh, in really new inventions are recombinations of older inventions. As, as the computer, you know, develops, they reshuffle it, you know, and combine it in a new way. <coughs> So, but the new thought which we pour today, you know, is that difference between the traditional and the uh, critical theory, which is which our discourse is about the critical theory, right? And uh, the it is the traditional theory uh, which is not aware of this species creating itself in continual antagonism with nature. It's a fight with the storms and all that and destroys things which we do, and we have to rebuild them again, and so on, but also the inner struggle of the different classes, you know, the class who does the heavy lifting, you know, hard work, it's cold, and they did this building, I wrote a book, but I'm warm here, you know, it's much more comfortable, I, I could not, with my age, I could not work, you know, like they do, my brother told me that all the time, you know, already 20 years ago. Uh, so, uh, different types of work, you know. Uh, I mean, it can also be hard and bothersome sometimes, but it's quite different if you have to be out there and it's hot, you know. When they build that house, the roof, you know, it was uh, a terrible heat. And I told the architect, take them down, take them down, you know. He said, I have enough of them, you know, let them go on. And they, they did not take them down from the, from the roof, you know, in that horrible heat. So the real production process is, is a hard and harsh thing, you know. Primitive capital accumulation along the East Coast was murderous, you know. The tenement houses and so was the Gulago, you know, the industrialization of uh, Russia and so on. So that uh, self-reproduction of the species is a very harsh. The conditions on that little planet here, you know, which strangely enough has all these conditions like the oxygen and the uh, uh, what we need, you know, in order to breathe and eat is uh, sometimes why I believe in providence somehow is it uh, it's too much accidentality, you know. Too many things have to fall into place in order to make Alex stand in the corner there, you know. It's, um, and, and all that should be accident. I mean, we have the chemicals in us which 14 billion go exploded in the Big Bang, you know. But how these damaged chemicals come up and build this uh, type of an organism, you know, which is very odd. Well, think of the whole sexual reproduction part in all species, you know. What a complicated thing that is. And variations, you know, obviously nature tried out many ways, you know, to do it or so. But also the eating process and, and so on, you know, hunting, fishing and digesting and cooking and fire and, I mean, I could never, you know, take that as a as a completely contingent or arbitrary. But there are contingent things happening, of course. You know, the dean of our school, the Connie Lowe, he was a wonderful.
old man and a student of Nibur and that. And then one day he drove out, his wife drove, and she ran against a tree. And she died right away, and he was uh, wounded. And, and then the priest, he was a minister, and they came, visited him, and said this was absolute contingency. Absolute contingency means no providence, no rationality whatsoever. And things like that do happen, but the overall reproduction process, you know, there is, in spite of all that contingency, there is some type of planning or purposiveness in, in this whole thing, you know. Um, okay, so that is what we want to get out of this today, right? This difference between, and it's not easy to grasp, so we can repeat it again, between the traditional theory, that's what we do on campus, right, in anthropology everywhere, and then the critical theory, which we do, you know, in some Ivy League colleges and uh, is widespread now. We, we have Dustin and Mike Ott and I, we wrote an article together. And it will appear in April at Harvard University. And there are 15 others, you know, and they are all critical theorists and they're all in Ivy League colleges. So it has, uh, it has spread, you know. Um, I, I have a question. When you characterize critical theory as finding the structure of an object okay. or the object, yeah. and then step two is self-reflection on your own like self-structure, I guess? Well, we talked about the structure of the object. In sociology, that would be society, right? Mm -hmm. And the structure of the subject, which would be the sociologist in that sense. Mm -hmm. And structure means his consciousness, uh, his anthropology, if he's a man, if he's a woman, mm -hmm. If he's black, he's white, his race, and so on. That is the structure of the subject. And then we have a third one. That is the reproduction process in which both of them, the object and the subject, are continually changing. Uh -huh. So I'm wondering, I guess when I was hearing that initially, I was thinking about postmodernism okay. and how kind of the first step is the self-reflection, the finding yeah. of your subjective reality. Yeah. Before you can approach the object, because okay. you're bringing invented yeah. classificatory schemes right. to exactly. your approach of reality. Yeah. So I'm wondering. Um, I guess th they're ultimately both going to look at kind of the the interplay and the look, relation. If you were, yeah, if you take a idealistic position like Kant, you will start with the subject and with our transcendental subjectivity, that means with our notions and concepts which we have and by which we approach things. If you are a materialist like Marx, you will start with the structure of the object. See, there is, um, there is a ten tendency on materialism to give the object priority over the subject. Mm -hmm. And uh, idealism means you give priority to the subject over the object. So wherever you start, but in the end, you know, they, uh, it is a continual interaction between the two, and one could not be without the other. You know, the object cannot be without the subject cannot be without the object. If we would fall, you know, that see, we would be annihilated in some way. With us would fall the family, you know, the objective spirit and the absolute spirit and. Oh, this is our word, you know, which we have produced, and uh, it, it can go under, you know. So I'm wondering, because with postmodernism, you get kind of a critical appraisal of whether uh, an object, wh whatever that is, actually exists, or if it's kind of a, a construction of, yeah. like, reorienting our classification. Yeah. Think of it as a continuum between two extremes. On one side you have the object, on the other side you have the subject. None can be without the other, right? There's a necessary relationship. In one case you have the idealistic position, on the other side you have the materialistic position. Also they cannot be without each other. Marcuse wanted to write a book about materialistic elements in the great idealistic philosophies from Plato to Hegel. It was never written, and so on. But it was aware, you know, that the great idealists also had materialistic elements. And it would not be very difficult to find in great materialists like Epicure or Marx or whatever, uh, um, or Schopenhauer, also idealistic elements, you know. So um, that's what I mean with necessity. There are notions which are necessarily connected with each other in the sense that one cannot be without the other. Which doesn't mean that, you know, that they are not ex 
extreme idealist to say, you know, that whole uh, thing says all our construct. <laughs> the construct word comes from Kant, you know. Um, but even Kant has a thing in itself, you know. There is a reality in itself, only we have to deal only with the appearances, you know. But that is, uh, but we <laughs> construct those appearances to a large extent. But there is something more than these appearances, you know. But he cannot talk about this more. So that is an extremely idealistic position. <laughs> and we, as we walk around as concrete beings, we have these idealistic and these materialistic things in us. You could say that an uh, animal is very idealistic because it doesn't respect, you know, the other. That means the little seeds, it just eats them up, you know. Or the cat does not respect the mouse, the reality of the mouse, the objectivity of the mouse. It plays with it and eats it up. It transforms everything into itself. All animals are idealists in that sense, right? They eat up the objective world. <coughs> yeah. So, good. Uh, do you have any other other questions? So, the, the you know, it's um, when things are a little bit difficult, the reading or what I say, it has nothing to do with your IQ. Your IQ is beautiful, right? It has something to do with that we have made certain decisions, namely this traditional theory from Kant to Parsons and so on. And in that sense, we are in the service of certain forces in the reproduction process, namely the third estate. We represent the interest. There's no knowledge without interest. The sociological knowledge which we have is steered by the interest of the third estate. The uh, critical theory, on the other hand, you know, uh, it is also created by, by the third estate. I mean, Horkheimer was the son of a factory owner, you know, from the same way, Adorno the same way, right? And this is not possible because, otherwise, because there is a monopoly of education. The dominant class uh, dominates the education as well and shapes it in his own image. What has to happen at of the class? In a certain sense, Marx and Engels, who belong to the bourgeoisie, were traitors who suddenly took the perspective of the third of the fourth estate, which to a large extent was completely unconscious of itself, or to some extent. Um, but that happened to the bourgeoisie too. There were clergymen, there were bishops and noblemen who wrote the constitutions of the bourgeois state. They were the best educated people. So they were traitors of their class. They identified with the oppressed, in good Christian terms, by the way, you know, very often uh, uh, motivated by the, uh, by the Sermon on the Mount or whatever. But Marx is a bourgeois, who, and so is Horkheimer and so on. They participated fully. The highest peak of bourgeois education is Hegel. And they participated in his logic and everything, and they would not be thinkable without Hegel at all. But then they turned them around. They inversed it in the interest of another class which is supposed to arise in the future. And the great disappointment that they don't rise enough. So the, uh, the fourth estate, you know, the, in, in uh, 1830, you know, they rebelled in Paris. In 1870, they rebelled in Paris. In 1917, they rebelled in Hamburg and Munich and were all beaten again. In Petersburg, St. Petersburg, they broke through, and in Moscow, and so on, for 70 years. And then comes the third counter revolution, the neoliberals, Reagan there, and uh, undoes the whole thing. Uh, but that's not the last word. See, the bourgeoisie was beaten for centuries before they finally, in the 18th century, took political power and guillotined the kings and the clergy, and so on. And this also, you know, that is this type of dynamic thinking which we don't do in traditional theory. By the way, you know, we don't, I don't want to convince you to give up the traditional theory and so on. You have to work in that. This department will not change as long as you are here or your children even, you know. They will teach that way as long as the bourgeoisie has this powerful position. 
as long as the president says, we want you all, you know, to join the military, <laughs> that means they are not so weak as one may think. They lost the Vietnam War now, and they lost the Iraq War and Afghanistan War, but they won the Second World War. Um, they won it over fascism and in a certain sense also about over socialism. So um, one should not underestimate, you know, the staying power of the bourgeoisie. And this sociology which you study is an expression of the interests of this uh, dominant ruling group there. And they will, you know, the lawmakers and so on, they will put stuff in there. As long as they think that the universities are on their side, they will support these universities. If they discover that there are critical people there, or too many of them, then the relationship will be changed. We had that in the 50 years in which I was here. Um, that I'm there is that I'm a theologian besides other things. They have, a, they have the idea that theologians must always be on their side. <laughs> it has something to do with the uh, ideological functionalization since Jefferson, you know. Let people read the Bible, and then we can govern them better. That is the whole, that's why the religion department is there too, in all the other universities as well. And even if it doesn't function well, they will still pay it. They think we are all theologians in that religion department. Tom Lawson, they let him always pray. <laughs> there was there was a meeting over there. He was a Baptist minister, but he had long forgotten about this, but they reminded him of it, and he had to pray. And so, so. The opposition in the department, we are not theologians or whatever, you know, that they can babble with themselves, but the overall picture, and if the community down there, which they did for some time, think they're all atheists in this department, then it's really dangerous. When I said 80, they wanted to dissolve the department. Then we told them that we have a pious people and we stayed. <laughs> Rudy, it's about 22. Did you okay, let's have our movie there. So if you want to, you can give me the paper the next time. If not, you have another week, okay? And we can look at a few more questions there. It's, it doesn't matter how fast we are going, uh, but that some fundamental thoughts uh, are important. So it's not... We are not in a conversion process. You stay traditional, and there's nothing wrong with it. Traditional theorists in one form or the other. Amy Durkheim or Max Weber, they were all great people. They were positivists, but they were, you know, uh, big, big scholars. Talco Parsons, too. Talco Parsons was a tiny little, uh, shy little fellow. And he went to Germany in Heidelberg. He studied in Heidelberg and got his dissertation there. And uh, then a girl danced with him once n one night, and she said, why are you here? And Parsons said, I want to study the sciences. And she said, what's wrong with you? Don't you have any sciences in the United States? And so Parsons was so shocked that he then thought of creating a unity type of science. That means a theory in which all the sciences would be combined. He was a biologist himself. So um, then he added anthropology, and he added sociology, and he developed a fantastic type of it. And all that with your old map there, he has it all in there, but all static. And then the students forced him, the student movement forced him to add social dynamics to it, and he did it. He refined social Darwinism and added it to it. So. But his heart was not in it. Everything was static. And uh, so, but, but a tremendous amount of work, you know. So when we say positivism and are critical, does not mean that positivism is nothing. Positivism is a great accomplishment, a tremendous accumulation of knowledge, of information, uh, think of the statistics, and uh, you know, all what hangs together. So uh, that's something which we have to learn here. When we are critical, does not mean we do not appreciate the work which they have done. Right? And the great thing here in our campus is, it's not the case everywhere, is that they are open for qualitative studies. I had one dissertation that was a little bit statistics, another one in political science. There was no statistics at all. Um, so that is that's unusual that they are open for this. Right? And as long as they are tolerant and allow the critical theory to exist, certainly not as a dominant part of the department, they would lose all funding. But, um, you know, as, as a part of it, that's, that's, that's fine. See that when you have this 
to the Gefriga thing, you also understand people, why people act. They are not acting that way because they are nasty or whatever. I would even say when they repressed our future studies, it was foreseeable that they would repress it, right? So um, one understands better why they repress when they repress. And that is, as they say, it's nothing personal. It's nothing personal, right? Ready? Yeah. Okay, we go back. We remember where we were. One say. W A N N. Say. And we have that meeting of governmental officials in order to introduce the final solution. There were other solutions before Madagascar, uh, immigration to Israel, Siberia. Uh, I don't know. They didn't send it to Soviet the Union. Said the Soviet Union, yeah. And we wanted to send it to Alaska, yeah, yeah. 132,000 Jews left in Germany proper. Austria, 43,700. By the way, the 6 million Jews killed is their statistic. It's a Nazi statistic. So we don't know if they exaggerated or if they diminished it. Thank you. very well there. That's really what they looked like, the fellows. I saw many of them. That's a liberal way. They look at Jewishness as a faith issue. Yes. No Jews. Not one. Right. That is 
the academic way in Germany, you bang on the thing there, and if you don't like it, you have to move your feet under your table there, back and forth.
activity. Generalization will be a growth industry. Who would not choose infertility to avoid evacuation? They would never know. They would never know what? If you use the word other than sterilized, then you think they would never know. It is simply a matter of secrecy. This man of blood carries very far. I find the plan and work. I find the plan personally insulting in that I have given years to codify the laws regarding interracial marriage, and now I'm presented with a clumsy, forgive me, unworkable structure. My work, these laws, any legal code worthy of the name restricts the enforcers of the law as well as its subjects. There are some things you cannot do.
and infer that you're shallow, ignorant, and naive about the Jews. You're lying. The, the, what the party rants on about is, is how, how inferior they are, some, some subspecies, and I keep saying how wrong that is. They are sublimely clever, and they are intelligent as well. My indictments of that race are stronger and heavier because they are real, not your uneducated ideology. They are arrogant and self-obsessed and calculating and reject the Christ, and I will not have them pollute German blood. Please, Doctor. He, he doesn't understand, and neither do his people. Deal with the reality of the Jew, and the world will applaud us. Treat them as, as uh, imaginary phantoms, evil in human fantasies, and the world will have justified contempt for us. To kill them casually without regard for the law martyrs them, which will be their victory. Sterilization recognizes them as a part of our species, but prevents them from being a part of our race. They'll disappear soon enough. And we will have acted in defense of our race and of our species and by the law. This fellow mentioned the law for the protection of German blood. I wrote that law. And when you have my credentials, then we'll talk about who loves the Jews and who hates them. People don't know how to hate them. Right. I know, too, that uh, when it comes to the half-mixed, that to kill them abandons that half of their blood, which is German. I'm very well known. Time to take a break. <laughs> Quarter after ready to do that. Very good. Okay. So, whoever can deliver a paper the next time, that's fine.